As Bill mentioned, we'll be <clears throat> in Acts 19, and we'll be starting with verse 23 in a bit and reading through the, uh, the end of the chapter. <clears throat> One of the things that's significant about um, Paul's time in Ephesus, there's two or three things that, that just really stand out. Um, the first is uh, he's here longer than any other time uh, that we have record of in terms of being in a particular place. And <clears throat> because of his nature and the love that he had for spreading the gospel and uh, being the apostle to the Gentiles, um, he's oftentimes on the move, but uh, there's this extended stay. He's in Corinth for 18 months. Uh, he's here in Ephesus for three years. And even his critics, <clears throat> Even his critics are going to say today that um, the message has spread throughout that entire area. And one of the things we noticed last week is that compared to the first missionary journey, which was mainly to smaller areas, uh, once he gets the Macedonian call, he will go across the Hellespont into Europe, and Philippi will be a major Roman city and then he'll be in Thessalonica and Berea, and each of those for a relatively short period of time. But whether it's by design or whether it's by the leading of the Spirit, we're not actually told. But from the second missionary journey on, he tends to spend longer period of times in areas that are Roman centers. And like, for example, uh, he doesn't tell them that he's a Roman citizen in Philippi until after he's beaten. And uh, I'm, I'm not making light of this in any way at all, but as one of my teachers said, he said, after that first missionary journey and you get to thinking, I've been stoned, I've been beaten, and all these other things, I think I'll say I'm a Roman citizen up front <laughs> and use that opportunity, and if I use the word leverage, to be able to basically even protect himself. We don't know, and we don't know, so this is all speculation, but w when you read that list, and there's, there's a couple of them in 2 Corinthians, uh, the shipwrecks, the beatings, the stonings, uh, beaten with rods, lashes, and all this other stuff, um, just my personal description is that by the end of his life, he's a walking scar, and we mentioned this when we were going through this, and I... I mentally just, just can't quite go there. But you just imagine being in a crowd and trying to find rocks big enough to kill somebody with. I mean, not just hurt them, but, but to kill them. And what was the situation? They left him for dead. He's probably unconscious from the stoning. And from the second missionary journey on, he tends to gravitate toward Roman centers where he will have more protection and... I think because of that, he is able to stay in Ephesus for this extended period of time. And yes, the Jews are going to cause all kinds of trouble. There's going to be things that happen. Uh, but still, that's more a part of um, his ministry from that, that time on. But our single point today is that the ministry in Ephesus ends with a riot in the theater. I had a friend that said, this is called going out with a bang. And here are these thousands of people shouting and everything else, and he wants to go in, and he's prevented, and decides, okay, as I have left, and you go back through the list, as I have left Philippi, as I've left Berea, as I've left Thessalonica, uh, it's time to leave, just, and again, probably for his own physical safety. But as Dr. Luke records this, one of the threads that keeps running through and it goes all the way back to the Gospel of Luke, is that in terms of the Romans and in terms of legal trials, Christianity was never seen as any type of attack or affront to the empire. And the majority of the time, if there is a trial or if there is some type of conflict, it is primarily between the Jews and the Christians. And like, for example, in Luke 22, the Jews give three different charges against Jesus. 
And three different times, Pilate tries to let him go. And basically says, you know, I, I find no guilt in this man is what he's basically saying by going through that. And that thread is going to continue on, and we'll see that in just a little bit. <clears throat> During the early Roman Empire, the estimate of the population of Ephesus is a quarter million people. 250,000 people live in the city of Ephesus. And we may do this on another occasion, but this is structurally how we're going to do it today. If the MacArthur Building is the theater, then there is a boulevard, sorry, headed towards 7-Eleven, <laughs> that is solid marble. The street's marble, the pillars are marble, there are all kinds of columns, there's all kinds of temples. Um, the Agora is the marketplace where people come in, both locally and come in from rural to, to be able to sell. So as you head back, to the west, then it's just this ornate, beautiful, beautiful, and, and you stop and think, when's the last time you've been in a town that has marble sidewalks? Marble columns and pillars and these huge ornate temples. And then you go back and think, oh, this is in the first century. And as you went down that walkway, the original harbor was within walking distance of the amphitheater. And so if you came in from ship from the west into Ephesus and then you docked and you got off, then once you left the area of the port and the area of the dock, then all the way up toward the theater, uh, you're walking on marble streets. And then over on the south side of the theater were kind of, I, I hope this is okay. It was the Nichols Hills of Ephesus. Do you know what I'm trying to say? I'm, I'm not trying to be offensive one way or another, but if I just say the, the south side of the theater was the Nichols Hills of, of Ephesus. And eventually, it's all going to be covered up, and they're still doing excavations. And there's all kinds of villas, there's all kinds of homes, and everything from the mosaics and the floor again to the marble and the columns, um, the wealth that both was Ephesus and, as we're going to see, came in and out of Ephesus is just absolutely staggering. And the word I like, and we don't use this from Scripture, but it's very helpful. There had been civil wars in Rome for virtually 60 years uh, leading up to the time of Augustus. And if you are these cities out in the province and Antony and Cleopatra are living in your city, you had better support them or they're going to punish you. But what happens if they lose? Then Octavian, who becomes Augustus, he's going to punish you because you helped Antony and Cleopatra. So it was kind of a no-win situation for these cities in the province. The final just major, major, major battle is fought in 31 BC on the west side of Greece, and it was called the Battle of Actium. And it started as a young man, Octavian, who becomes Augustus, is 18 years old. And as the time goes by, he gets more and more forces. They have this defeat. And the period of time, once Augustus consolidates things, is called the Roman peace, Pax Romana. And because of the Roman peace, then no longer do you have these uh, warring generals and the, and the Romans coming and going. And the cities, like Ephesus, for the next 200 years are just going to flourish and are going to grow and become more and more uh, significant and more and more powerful. And the coming of the Roman peace, especially in Asia Minor, then produced just this enormous time of, of prosperity. <clears throat> Our Roman history teacher in Sydney said, too, and I was the only American in the class, he said, through much of the last century, we have lived in the Pax Americana, the American peace. And you think, what would have happened in, with our son growing up in Australia until he was 12? He's in an American history class his junior year. 
And he says, Dad, it's scary how close Hitler came to taking over all of Europe. And you think, what would our world be like today if we hadn't gone and, and had stopped that? And so to the students who <laughs> were not American, he said, today we live in the Pax Americana, an extended period of time of peace because of the, of the efforts of that country. So if you go back to the first century, once Augustus finally comes to power, and you're not having all these rival factions and all these civil wars, then we're going to have 200 years of prosperity. And I always think of the verse in the, in the book of Galatians. Do you remember chapter 4 and 4? In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, uh, to redeem those under the law. And I go all the way back to the 600s, sorry, let me just shake the chills down. A young man is carried into Babylonian captivity in 606. And just imagine if you're Daniel, I don't know about you, but if it was me, I would at least want to look back and have one last look of Jerusalem as they're carrying me off. And so here this young man, 606, probably a teenager, then his city loses, the Babylonians win, he's carried up the Fertile Crescent, he's going to spend his entire life either in Babylon or in Persia control, and God is going to give him this vision of this statue as the head of gold, which is going to be the Babylonians, and then this is going to be the Persians, the legs are going to be the Greeks, and guess what the feet are going to be? The Romans. And so 600 years before it happens to a godly, faithful teenager, when he's not going to keep being a teenager, he's going to grow up, but that's what he was when he got there, then God gives him this vision. This is what's going to happen in terms of world history for the next 600 years. And then Paul says, in the fullness of time, when all of these things had taken place, and when Augustus had come in control, and when you have this 200 years of Roman peace, for the first time, one of our history teachers said, you could, if you were a Roman citizen, you could travel from India to Great Britain without a passport. And then he quietly said, try doing that today. And just stop and think about that. The Greek language was the common language, you have coinage, but you have an extended period of time of peace. And I can remember my mom and dad going to school in a small country school 10 miles outside of Sayre. And one of their teachers said, you know, someday I've been reading, we're going to build an interstate system from coast to coast. And these people who are driving horses and mules are looking at each other like, surely not. And he said, yeah, someday there's going to be an interstate system all the way across this country. It's going to bypass towns so that if we need to move military equipment from one side of the country to the other, we can do that efficiently. Well, what's going to happen in the Pax Romana? You have all of these battalions. You have all of these Roman soldiers. And when they're not fighting, let's keep these guys in shape. And how better to keep some Roman soldiers in shape than building roads? There are still some roads used today that were built by Roman soldiers in the fullness of time. Transportation, world peace, economy is going to be growing, and that's when the Apostle Paul is sent out as the apostle to the Gentiles, <clears throat> and the church is given the best opportunity to spread out in growth, but what's his procedure? Goes to the synagogue until they run him out and in the synagogue he will argue from the prophets and there will also be Hebrews and Jews but there will be God fears people who are Gentiles who are reading the Old Testament and listening to God and the people who become believers come out and churches are formed and all of this takes place <clears throat> during the Roman peace <clears throat> When you look at number three, the harbor eventually silts up. There had been a lot of forest around Ephesus, and they gradually cut down the forest to do 
building projects and stuff. And over a period of time, the harbor, like I said, that, that literally came up within walking distance, moved further and further back, and then eventually it's a significant distance away and a part of the decline centuries later of the city of Ephesus was that wonderful harbor that you brought up right to the edge of town then is going to silt up. But all through the New Testament, people can come and go, and two things are happening. A lot of goods are coming into Asia Minor, so all of those things will come through Ephesus. And as we mentioned earlier in a class, the wealth from Asia Minor and specifically from Ephesus was a part of the building of the, of the ancient city of Rome. And so if you go to the city of Rome today, and again, you see all of these columns and all these ruins and stuff, the majority of that was financed from things that came through Asia Minor, but specifically came through Ephesus. And so what a better place to start a church. You're gonna have people coming and going, you have goods coming, and this is a part of why Paul is gonna spend that period of time there. When you look up and down the west coast of Asia Minor, uh, Pergamum, Sardis, and Ephesus um, were kind of like Dallas and Fort Worth, or like Los Angeles and New York. Uh, these three cities just competed. Anytime there was gonna be a temple built to a god or something, then they all had people in Rome trying to get this built in their area. And as we're going to see with the temple of Artemis, if you have a temple and the Caesars are going to gradually build temples after Augustus, there's going to be festivals, there's going to be people who come and go. Um, <clears throat> for 18 months uh, to get here from Midwest City, we drove around the fairgrounds. And some weekends, there's not a parking place in the whole place. And guess what's there? These huge pickup trucks. People have brought their trailers. I don't know if they're having llamas, goats, horses, or whatever else it is. But I'm going to Australia once, and I'm sitting next to a guy, and he said, um, I came from Los Angeles to the llama show. Uh, I have 53 acres, and I have some llamas, and I'm thinking about showing them in Oklahoma City. And so I just came to see kind of what it's like. And he said, we all enjoy Oklahoma City because we don't have to go to North Carolina. We don't have to go all the way across the country. And I just thought, well, I'll ask him. I said, how many nights did you stay? He said, well, I stayed three nights. I rented a car, and I ate meals the whole time I was here. How much income did that one man bring to Oklahoma City on his three-day visit to the show at the fairgrounds? And so that's what these temples were to the local city. Well, another quick example, uh, Chuck White, one of my dear friends, uh, was working at the Softball Hall of Fame and ESPN said, we want to completely redo the whole stadium. We want to take out all the stuff behind home plate. We want the cameras behind home plate. We want the whole stadium built for the Women's World Series golf, uh, softball tournament. And so they finished tournaments for two years in July and had this huge, massive building program. How many millions of dollars come into Oklahoma City when all of these teams come from coast to coast and their parents come and people from school come and it's a huge financial benefit to our city. So that's why with Pergamum and Smyrna and Ephesus there's this enormous competition for who's going to get the next temple and who's going to have this particular office and then as the Roman influence extended these people in the upper areas gradually become Roman citizens and the top group are going to be the senators and the group under are the equestrians or the knights. Equities, if you hear equities, you hear equestrian. They have a property to own horses. And so each of these have a property level to them, and these Greeks gradually are going to grow up through these areas and are actually going to become a huge part of the Roman Empire. But when you look at number five, above everything else, Ephesus is known as the guardian the temple keeper of Artemis. And if you look at the descriptions of this, they, and we find this in chapter 19, uh, the description is her image fell from heaven. And we don't know exactly, but some wonder if a meteor fell in that area and then different things were built. 
Let me go ahead and do this verbally, and we'll see this in print here in a second. We mentioned last week you could put three to four of the Acropolis in Athens inside the Temple of Artemis. And one writer that I was reading recently said, think a soccer stadium. Not field, think soccer stadium. 127 marble columns, 60 feet high, and here's this massive place. And it is built in such a way that, and again, if this is the temple in this area, especially on the east side, there was a big window up there and a big statue of Artemis is in the middle among a host of other things. And parts of the day, literally the sun would come bursting through the temple and would feature the statue. One of my favorite things about both living in Oklahoma and God's nature is that occasionally we have a cloudy day, but there's a break in the cloud, and here's this stream of light that just comes streaming through. Uh, I always think of a parable. The kingdom of heaven is like, and it's like, shoom, here comes a ray of sunshine about the kingdom. And isn't it just beautiful some days when you have those openings and you see those rays of sun just shining through and all the things that happen around us? And in this massive, massive temple, and we don't have electricity, but then there are certain windows that are set so that at certain parts of the day, the sun would come straight through, and here you have this huge, huge, massive temple, and here's a statue of the goddess, and she will be illuminated by the sun that comes shining through on those particular days, and that was a part of the, the structure that was there. So <clears throat> when you look at 5.5, five, and this is something that's just of, of, of great interest to me, the temple was about a mile and a half from downtown, from the theater in the main part of the city. So again, if we are the theater in Memphis, um, think John Marshall. Think those offices over on that side of the lake. And right behind, well, obviously, the amphitheater is built into the side of the mountain, and you have to go around. But if we're in the theater and in downtown Ephesus, then the Temple of Diana is a mile and a half out. And by 104, a foundation, a grant, is given. And several times through the year, uh, they would carry the statues of the Roman emperors and other things, but especially of Artemis and the young men would carry these through the city. And so you think if we start at John Marshall and we come all the way around and they're gonna come through the theater and make this trip all the way through. Kind of think of Macy Day, Rose Bowl, parade on foot. And, and this was done for hundreds of years that people would carry these objects and these idols through the city. But the Temple of Diana is going to be a mile and a half out of downtown. And so one of the significant items of temples in the ancient world is that they were banks. They didn't have a banking system as such, and fewer people are gonna rob from a deity, from a god or a goddess, than they are gonna rob from just an individual. And so the significance of great is the goddess of the Ephesians is that she is also going to be the center, the temple of the banking system for that whole area. And when you look at the description, merchants, kings, and even cities are gonna make deposits in these temples and that's gonna serve as the banking system. Uh, the first temple, and there was a, an early one, was destroyed in 365. And <laughs> a power hunger guy burnt it down to get the recognition for it. Uh, the current temple was built in 323 BC and it is gonna be destroyed in 262. The Goths are gonna come through. And so when the people finally get into the theater and all the uproar takes place, what's the cry? Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And that both is gonna be the cry that Demetrius is gonna bring about and that's also gonna be that which calms the crowd when the town clerk uh, speaks to the people. So if you read on the back page, let's read Acts 19. And just notice, 
just this quick thumbnail description that Luke gives us about what happens. About that time, there rose no little disturbance concerning the way, and we'll touch on that in just a second. A man named Demetrius, a silversmith, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together with the workmen in a similar trades, and kind of think union. They didn't have unions as we have, but, but they were called trade guilds, but kind of think of that. And he said, and notice his speech, men, you know that from this business we have our wealth. And one writer I read this week said, money is the root of what? <laughs> All evil. This is, this is how we survive, is making these statues. And then he goes on, and you see and not hear, and you hear not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that gods made with hands are not gods. And what does Demetrius do? It's not only in our city, this guy's been a menace and an influence all throughout our region, and he actually gives us a description of the work that's going on. There's a danger that not only this trade of ours will come into disrepute, but the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing, and she may be deposed of her magnificence, she of whom all Asia and the world worship. When they heard this, they were enraged, and they were crying out, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So the city was filled with confusion, they rushed together into the theater, and they were dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus, who are Macedonians, Paul's companions in travel. But when Paul wished to go in, the disciples would not left him. And even some of the Asiarchs, who were friends of his, sent to him and urged him, do not venture into the theater. Now some cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was in confusion. Most of them didn't know why they had come together. And some of the crowd prompted Alexander, whom the Jews had put forward. And notice who he is. The Jews do not want to be confused with the Christians. And so the Jews probably are going to have a speech to put the Christians and Paul down because they, want, they don't want to be confused with them. But <clears throat> when Alexander, the Jew, motioned with his hand and he wanted to make a defense... <laughs> They recognized he was a Jew, and, and think about this. For two hours, they cried out with one voice, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Wouldn't you want to catch your breath after a while? <laughs> I mean, this is, every time I read this, I just kind of laugh, and I'm just thinking, <clears throat> in a few days in Stillwater, there's going to come this cry really loud and clear, and one side's going to say, Orange, and the other side's going to say power, and the Norman one side's going to say boomer, and side. but they don't do it nonstop for two hours. And that, every time I read this, I just laugh, and I think, these folks are really fired up. And, uh, well, this is more like a Texas A&M pep rally the night before a football game. All these people get together in the stadium and do it. There's nobody on the field, and they do cheers and all this stuff and get all wound up. So here they are shouting and chanting for two hours. When the town clerk had quieted the crowd, he said, men of Ephesus, who is there who does not know that the city of Ephesus is the temple keeper of the great Artemis and of the sacred stone that fell from the sky? And see the reference? Probably a meteor had fallen, and they're going to take this to be a part of the things that were made into probably even the idol itself. And then he mentions, these things cannot be denied. You ought to be quiet, do nothing rash. For you have brought these men here who are neither sacrilegious or blasphemers of our God. Therefore, if Demetrius and the craftsmen have a complaint against anyone, the courts are opened. There are proconsuls and let them bring charges against one another. But if you seek anything further, it will be settled in the regular assembly for we are really in danger of being charged with rioting today, since there is no cause that we can give to justify this commotion. And when he said that, he dismissed the assembly. 
I just made a note, and, and we don't know why, I, I wonder, but one of the early terms that Luke uses for the church is the way. And this, Luke may not have ever had this in mind, but when I read John 14, what did Jesus say? I am the way, the truth, the life. And you'll see these references sprinkled throughout uh, the middle part of Acts. Then Luke refers to the church as the way. When you look at the next page, Demetrius offers a pretty accurate assessment of Paul's work. It starts in Ephesus and it's gone throughout all of these other places. And consistently, whether he's in Corinth or wherever he is, Paul is constantly giving an all-out attack against idolatry. And it's just, it's hard for us to imagine just the multitude of temples that were in each of these cities, the statues that were given. And, well, well let me do it this way. And, and, and I'm saying this kindly, not, not critically. Through the years while we were in Sydney, we had maybe three or four people who had been raised and grown up in Catholicism become New Testament Christians. And you talk about what a major change. And in talking with a couple of them, their comment was, I enjoy coming to church, but your building is so naked. What are you thinking? How, how many icons, how many images, how many visual things are in a Catholic church? And if that's been your whole religious experience all your lives, aren't these beautiful green trees? <laughs> and you're used to having statues and everything from water fountains and incense and all this, you know, all this other stuff. And then you come into our building and we have these beautiful pews and we have these beautiful green trees and all of the foliage that's growing up front, it's a, it's a real shock. <clears throat> the biggest challenge for many people in the first century to becoming Christians is all of their life they have worshiped something that they can see and touch and sacrifice to, and now they're gonna worship somebody that they can't see. Our opponents would refer to us as atheists because we don't have a temple. And you stop and think about it. The Jews have a temple in Jerusalem. There's a temple for every god and goddesses all throughout the Roman Empire. And then we come along as Christians and we say, oh, by the way, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. But in terms of challenge and transition, that would have been a major change for people as, as they became Christians. And so Demetrius, prompted this huge response, they rush into the theater. This is just an amazing thing. The theater in Ephesus is 66 rows cut literally out of the side of a mountain, and estimates are between 24 to 26,000 people could be in this theater. If you stand on the stage, you can walk in any spot in the theater and speak in a voice like this, and the acoustics are cut out of the stone and such that you can hear the voice on the stage or you can hear the voice from the stage without a microphone at all. And here is this huge crowd of people that comes rushing into this theater and it probably has these big columns and stuff on the back and echoing all throughout the city is the chant and the cry that's there. The town clerk is gonna stop them. And then you'll notice, look at the contrast. The believers previously are going to burn magic books 50,000 silver pieces, and the non-believers are all concerned about the worship of the goddess. So if you look on the back page, the thing that's unique about God is that he is outside of creation. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. All kinds of idolatry and other things, the gods are within nature. And Luke is going to keep saying Christianity is a legal religion. You remember when we we're in Corinth and they drug Paul before, or drug Christians before Gallio? He will not even hear the case, dismisses it. What does the town clerk do? There's nothing specifically illegal. They haven't robbed temples, on and on. And there's this thread that's going to run all the way through. And then anticipate, as we come to Paul, he goes back to Jerusalem and is arrested. There are going to be five speeches 
defending both himself and Christianity. And, as I said earlier, the concerns of Demetrius about Artemis and Ephesus are both their concern and they're also addressed by the town clerk. So just close with this. Can you imagine worshiping in someone's living room or a small hall within the shadow of one of the seven wonders of the world? And especially if you have worshiped previously in this temple and here's something again you could burn incense to, have sacrifices, everything's really physical, it's very tactical, it's very visual. And then you start worshiping in my living room. And one of the things that's so interesting is that when this city is destroyed, never to be rebuilt, it was eventually silted up and covered and it wasn't discovered until the 1800s. And when Mr. Wood, an archeologist, found it, it was under 20 feet of earth. So if you go to Ephesus today, as they did all this, and you just imagine having to move 20 feet of dirt to go down and find the base and the foundation because it had just been covered up through the centuries. And so again, think John Marshall, and you start excavating how many tons of earth are we gonna have to move to get back to the base of this. And so in the process, they have reconstructed one pillar. And, what, and this one isn't quite that big, but what were the original pillars? 127, they were 60 feet high but they have found parts and they have reconstructed one pillar at the site of the temple of Artemis. And oftentimes a stork or another type of bird comes along and builds a nest on top of the, of the pillar. So I always think of this for something that was so emotional and so powerful and so strong in the first century. Where's the temple of Artemis today? It's in ruins. And I'd like to read this verse, and we're done. <clears throat> Paul told the Ephesians in chapter 2, verse 19, You are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints. You are members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure is joined together, grows into a holy temple, in the Lord, built on the foundation of the apostles, Christ, the cornerstone, Christians are being built into a holy temple of the Lord. In him, you are being built together into a dwelling for the place of God by the Spirit. And when I read that, I just simply think, one temple is in ruins, and this temple will never be destroyed.